Hello and welcome to Braincast, the student-run podcast that aims to showcase the breadth of innovation and creativity within both psychology and neuroscience across the University of Sussex, as well as further afield. Our guest today is Aya Tarabin of the University College London's Queen Square Institute of Neurology. Aya is a postgraduate research student, as well as the host of another wonderful podcast, Your Brain Uncovered where she talks with pioneering scientists from peer-reviewed journals in order to translate research findings into everyday accessible content. At UCL, Aya's research focuses on taking a laboratory approach to better understand the molecular basis and pathophysiological mechanisms of primary mitochondrial diseases, as well as some fundamental aspects of mitochondrial biology. In today's episode, I speak with Aya about her journey to study mitochondrial function, her thoughts and opinions on current debates within mitochondrial biology, as well as some moments from running her own podcast that have been particularly memorable. Let's begin. Aya, hello. Welcome to Braincast. How are you doing this morning? Good morning. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me with you. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. This is actually a really special episode, as you are our first external speaker from outside of Sussex. Um, So one of our goals within the podcast was to produce something that students could both use and be a part of. Um, So on previous episodes, we just got students to volunteer as a guest interviewer and then speak with members of the faculty and their lecturers about their research to kind of find out a little bit more about it. Um, Since I've taken over as manager, it's been one of my goals to further expand the audience um, and provide students with the opportunity to speak with individuals from external institutions. So yeah, it's super exciting to have you on the podcast today. Oh, well, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. I hope this is one of many um, external speakers. So yeah, yeah. brilliant. Right. So I'll get started with the questions. So you currently work as a postgraduate researcher at um, UCL. What was your journey like to get to this position from undergrad? Could you kind of tell us a little bit about why you chose mitochondrial um, research? Of course. Um, So a little bit about myself. So I got shaped as a researcher at the intersection of gene therapies and drug repurposing approaches. Um, My undergraduate degree in clinical neuroscience sparked a passion for research in me that I've been pursuing ever since. And um, I, I, yeah, and so I did get my first taste of independent lab work actually quite late. Um, And um, it was just last year at the UCL School of Pharmacy. And there I carried a project focused on identifying the relationship between um, PEPRE agonists and peripheral nerve regeneration, which uh, practically what I was doing was I would throw some drugs into cells and watch how fast they grow, um, you know, based on different concentrations. Um, Yeah, in hopes of helping people that are suffering from a limb or uh, peripheral nerve injury in a sense. Mm. So that's how it started off. And then this preclinical project really made me wonder whether I could help translate these really interesting findings um, from bench to bedside. Uh, but being in my position, I generally did not know how to do that. So I, um, I enrolled in a master's program, a master's of research specifically um, at UCL's Queen Square. Uh, to just better understand the principles of clinical drug trial development and neuropharmacology. Um, and while I was there, um, I happened to, you know, attend lectures by wonderful professors. And I was quite fascinated by one focusing on mitochondrial diseases. So, um, and yeah, that's how it all started. So it wasn't like I was 12 years old and I knew that the mitochondria was the powerhouse of the cell and I'm going to devote my life to it. No, not really. I stumbled upon it by accident. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. The ongoing research is amazing. It's still at its infancy, but it's really booming uh, in the upcoming years. Um, and that's how I landed at the lab I'm currently in. I reached out to the professor. Um, I told him how. Um, interested I am in the work and what I plan and hope on doing if I was to join this team and yeah it's been great it's been a wonderful year so far. Amazing so what's the kind of projects you're working on in the lab at the moment what what's the kind of areas that you're studying? So currently um, I'm practically a researcher at the Pichelli lab and I'm conducting a project focused on developing in vitro models for primary mitochondrial diseases um, aka PMDs. So PMDs, they're really 
There are prevalent inherited neurological disorders, and they affect approximately one in 4,300 individuals, and they're caused by genetic mutations in mitochondrial or nuclear DNA. And um, these disorders result in impaired mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, um, which practically can lead to a lot, uh, like a variety of symptoms uh, ranging from neurological, muscular to cardiac manifestations. But and, um, here's the catch. Unfortunately, there is no effective treatment currently available. Um, and, and that is really due to the variable clinical and biochemical manifestations of PNDs and the complexity of mitochondrial genetics. Uh, so that is where I come in, trying to be a part of the solution. And what I'm doing is I'm building um, practically um, models of certain lentiviral vectors and genes um, and genetic mutations that are linked to uh, PMDs, and I'm trying to practically characterize these models to further screen for drugs um, to serve as a treatment. Mm -hmm. Have you had any opportunities for like interdisciplinary collaboration? Do you think this is important within the study of mitochondrial diseases to kind of understand them better and then translate them onto um, like healthcare outside of a lab? Oh, definitely, most certainly. I mean, not just in research or in mitochondrial diseases, like no man's an island, you generally can't do anything on your own. Um, and it's essential in this field and in any other field. Um, now, here, when you're studying mitochondrial function, this requires expertise from uh, various disciplines. And that includes, you know, molecular biology, neuroscience, biochemistry, genetics, mm -hmm. and um, that's just some of many other disciplines. So yeah, by collaborating with experts from different fields, we can really bring together, you know, diverse perspectives, methodologies and approaches to understanding mitochondrial function, but it also allows us to bridge the gap between basic science and translational research. Yeah. So yeah, it's essential and we are fortunate enough to have collaborators from the University of Cambridge, uh, from the University of Newcastle, um, and that is all because we're a part of the mito cluster. Mm -hmm. um, in the UK. So this is one of my favorite things to ask um, within these interviews. Are there any debates going on within the study of mitochondrial research that kind of fascinate you as to like which side you're on? Um, kind of what are your thoughts and opinions on on these debates? Um, sure, I would I would love to shed a bit of light on some of the ongoing debates. Uh, but in terms of my thoughts, uh, these are at the end of the day, my thoughts. Yeah, uh, so <laughs> don't, um, yeah, uh, don't take them to heart. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, there are plenty of ongoing debates. Um, one that really interested, interests me specifically is um, a, kind of revolves around the role of mitochondrial dysfunction in aging and age-related diseases. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, while it is widely acceptable that mitochondrial dysfunction contributes to the aging process and age-related diseases such as Parkinson's, there's still mm -hmm. ongoing discussion about the precise mechanism involved and the extent to which um, mitochondrial dysfunction is caused or is a consequence of these conditions. Um, so yeah, and there are debates about the efficacy of different therapeutic interventions um, related to, you know, uh, PD and Alzheimer's. Um, and some kind of, um, and there's, there's a lot of so if we were to get a little more specific, uh, researchers argue about the use of specific compounds and in dietary interventions um, and um, about how heavily we should be, you know, emphasizing important lifestyle factors when in reality, um, there are so many genetic underpinnings that need to be resolved, right, mm. uh, to begin with. So, yeah, there's plenty to deal with. It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very complex. It's very yeah. interesting at the same time. So is your lab working on any of these current topics at the moment that you've just discussed? Um, yes, so higher level um, intro to what my lab does. Mm -hmm. um, um, most of the work that's ongoing in the lab is currently focused on primary mitochondrial diseases. So my project feeds into theirs. And um, that is because, um, how do I tell you this? Well, we, we at Queen Square, we are, um, we're right across the street from UCLH, mm -hmm. uh, right? So my lab really um, um, is fortunate enough to be able to combine clinical observation observations with laboratory approaches to better understand the molecular bases and the pathophysiological mechanisms of PMDs, even the fundamental aspects of mitochondrial biology. Mm -hmm. So really at the Pacelli lab, what we have are um, a range of uh, clinical studies 
um, in vitro studies, um, and now we're include uh, we're getting involved in in vivo. Um, uh, studies uh, that is thanks to the, the MRC Mito cluster, which is part of the MRC National Mouse Genetics Network. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're hoping to be generating mouse models that are aimed at understanding neurological and other human conditions uh, linked with mitochondrial dysfunction um, very soon. So yeah. Okay, so moving aside from your research for a moment, I would really like to talk to you about your podcast, um, Your Brain Uncovered. Um, I have particularly enjoyed the career series um, that you've put on um, and just it's so cathartic in a way for students to hear about um, like the journey of a like successful researcher because I feel like when you're kind of in your early 20s and still in undergrad it's quite easy to see these successful academics um, or just successful individuals within their position and kind of forget about their journey of how they actually got there um I know I do that myself quite a lot so yeah being able to listen to your career series and actually find out about how individuals work their way to the position they got to um is just it, I know it's um a major source of inspiration for Braincast itself and has a lot of personal benefits as well um so yeah, could you maybe tell us a little bit about your inspirations behind starting the podcast and like how you got into podcasting? Um, of course, I would love to. Um, so uh, to begin with, uh, the podcast was, uh, I'd like to give big credits to COVID because uh, <laughs> um, that is when it started, really. Um, I hadn't... Um, I spent a lot of my time, um, you know, especially when you're in isolation, listening to podcasts. It gets yes. to company. Uh, you know um and um i just uh, i think the journey into podcasting really began as a desire to uh share my interests right um i was listening to brilliant speakers and i was talking to you know brilliant scientists on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. and i thought why not share that right um I feel like it can be a lot really challenging uh, for people outside of the scientific community to access this knowledge. Mm. And um, I think there should be more emphasis in open science communication. And that is um, how I, that is really my number one motivation for launching this platform. So I can just maybe be able to distill complex scientific concepts into more engaging and accessible discussions um, and make use of it, you know, in our everyday life. Uh, so to be able to really convert this knowledge into um, everyday tools is something that um, I hope my podcast can, you know, serve as a platform to do so. Um, but yeah, and uh, neuroscience is wonderful, right? Science is beautiful as well, and it should be more approachable. Um, and I hope to inspire curiosity and really empower listeners to apply some of this knowledge into their lives. Yeah, of course. I know even as someone within the scientific community, I know how hard it is to um, kind of gain this knowledge, even from like people that I know and in topics that I do kind of have a bit of an understanding in, it's still so difficult to access this information. So yeah, having... Um, little episodes that people can listen to kind of wherever in the car while you're cooking I think it's such a brilliant way of um being able to share this knowledge um, and make it really accessible so with that have you had any kind of really special moments that have kind of stuck out to you have you had anything that's made you kind of think like oh I'm actually you know doing something really beneficial here I've made something that's really useful for people have you had any of those moments yet Yes, yes, I have, I have, and they were not, uh, they were very uh, spontaneous, unexpected, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, see, like, yeah, events that happened that really, um, yeah, they, they, they really helped me um, kind of invest more in the podcast, because mm -hmm. I, when I started off, um, I did not start off with a five-year plan for my podcast. <laughs> I started off with, oh, this is amazing. This is the most fun I've ever had. I lose track of time. I get to talk to people I look up to. And and like a bonus, I get to share it with people I love, right? Um, but um, some notable events, if we were to go back in time, where, for example, I recorded an, an very interesting episode um, on Tourette's syndrome mm -hmm. with um, Professor Catherine Dyke. And um, I had people who, people reach out to me from all over the world telling me that I've always suffered from Tourette's. I never had the, the courage to really accept that um, and be able to deal with it and speak about it um, publicly. Mm -hmm. 
and you, I'm, like your episode has inspired me to seek out help and, uh, um, you know, um, open up about it a little more. And um, that really, that pushed me to record another one. And I actually had the people reach out to me, um, send off voice notes that are included in the episode itself, which was great. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, that was that was really nice. I had people reach out to me and tell me that um, it, it's it's not your it's not the content of your episode that um, has really helped me, but it's the idea of having uh, someone's voice keep me company while I'm yeah. <laughs> doing everyday life admin, <laughs> oh, <amazing. laughs> which is very random, isn't it? But it's <laughs> oh, amazing! Right, yeah. so I've got one more question for you. Um, Obviously, you've already got your foot in the door with um, science communication with your podcast, um, working alongside your research. Do you think research is something you'd like to continue doing or are you kind of what what's your kind of career aspirations in terms of neuroscience? Are you more torn towards research or scientific communication or? Um, I think, uh, well, really, my yeah, um, ultimately uh, is the question kind of would you like to know if I'm oh, I'm interested in building a career in academia or the industry or is it more of like uh, because if I was to stay in academia then I'd have the pleasure of doing my research and promoting open science communication at the same time yeah uh, uh, yeah so it's not very black and white um, but yeah my uh, I would love to build a career as a neuroscientist mm -hmm. um, I do not confine myself into boxes just because yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I find a lot of, uh, I'm curious and I find a lot of things interesting, but uh, <laughs> my heart sits uh, there at the lab and I hope to build a career as an academic and promote open science communication whenever I possibly can. Um, Brilliant. Do you have anything you'd like to kind of mention? Obviously, this podcast is aimed at undergraduate students um, within the neuroscience and psychology field. Is there any kind of advice or anything you'd like to mention um, before we finish off the podcast? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, don't let the don't let the fear of the fear of rejection stop you from seeking what it is that you really desire. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that be in academia, whether that be in the industry, mm -hmm. uh, professional life, or even, you know, any other aspect of your life. Don't yeah. let that stop you, right? Mm -hmm. You want to be part of the solution? You yeah. gotta you gotta risk it all, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, don't let the and um one more thing, you're always a value. Um, regardless of what you think, wherever you go, you're always a value. You always have something to offer. Um, so it's less about um it's less about, you know, um, waiting for the right time. And it's more about just do it. <laughs> just do it. Yeah. I've, the best things that have ever happened to me career wise have been, you know, have come from that attitude of just do it. What, yeah. what is there? Yeah, I'm actually so glad you mentioned um, the bit about not waiting until the right time in your life in order to do something. Um, I think that's, that's definitely something that students and undergraduate students struggle with a lot is just thinking you can't or you shouldn't do anything until you've you know got all of these qualifications behind you in order to prove that you can do something um and I found with this podcast and you know starting um working within the the neuroscience society that I just wasn't qualified enough and I know a couple of years ago I probably wouldn't have done any of this um you know started this podcast or managed the podcast um because I didn't it wasn't the right time. I didn't think I had the right knowledge and skills in order to do it. But really, the only way you'll learn is to just kind of dive headfirst into it and just learn along the way. Um, and yeah, this has definitely been one of my most proud moments is running this podcast with very little knowledge of what I'm doing and how to podcast. But yeah, that's such great advice to just go for it. Unfortunately, we are out of time now, but I just wanted to say, Aya, thank you so much for joining us on Braincast today. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you, and I hope you've had as much fun as I have. Thank you. It was, it was really fun. I kind of lost track of time. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, thank you so much for having me on your show. And for any of your listeners out there, if they need help or support with um, any aspect of their life, please feel free to reach out. And that concludes our latest episode of Braincast, featuring the wonderful Aya Tarabine. 
It was such a joy to speak with Aya today, hearing her incredible advice for students and telling us about her research within mitochondrial diseases. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. In terms of Aya's own podcast, you can listen over on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and all of the usual podcast places, but you can also directly follow the link within this podcast description. All of Aya's contact details will also be found here if you fancy asking her a question of your own. In terms of Braincast, don't forget to give us a follow on Instagram at US Neurosoc, as well as Twitter with the same handle name for more updates. We always value your feedback, so pop us a message and tell us what you thought of this new episode.